sheep milk versus cow milk versus goat milk. Which is the best tasting one and what should you have on your homestead dairy? How many animals do you need to keep and breed before you wind up keeping a male on your homestead? We use AI artificial insemination for our cows. Why don't we do that for our goats? We're going to answer those questions in today's episode of Ask Homesteady. Let's dive right in. You may have noticed a slight change in my introduction there. We are changing how we do Ask Homesteady. Over the last, I think it's been six months, we've been doing this now. We've been answering your questions here on the channel. By the way, this is Ask Homesteady, the episode of our show where we answer the questions that you leave on our YouTube videos. We're doing something a little bit different. Ask Home Study used to be my one day a week where I just sat down and I did a hour long show answering your questions. And then I tried to answer the questions better than before, more elaborate, you know, try to really answer the questions good. And they started turning into these hour and a half monstrosities. And people were like, Aust, oh, we like hearing you talk sometimes, but like an hour and 45 minutes, bro. I don't even want to hear, you know, Darth Vader talk for an hour and 45 minutes. So I don't know why I went with Darth Vader, just, you know, that nice voice, Luke. Anyways, they were getting too long and too crazy, so we split them up and everybody seemed to like the split. Instead of an hour, hour and a half, now they became like 45 minute episodes. And then this last week I noticed we had a 20 minute episode and more people watched it and it was really well received. So from now on, here's what we're doing. We're gonna do Ask Home Study. We're answering your questions. The, this is the video we do every week where we answer the questions you have left on our regular vlog videos. And we're gonna try now doing them all weekend long. I still get to just sit down and record this in one day, but you'll get to all weekend long get answers in videos that are very watchable. So they're no longer gonna be like your homework for the weekend because we homeschool our kids. We hate homework, so why should I be giving you homework? Really good questions today, a lot about goats and breeding and kids. Let's dive right in with the first question. This week we did a video about breeding goats and we talked about the four different options you have when you're going to breed your goat. You can plan like a meetup where your two goats get together and then you leave and hope it worked. You can drop your does off at a farm and let the farm take care of the buck service. You can take and rent a buck, lease a buck, and bring them to your farm for a month or two. Or you can buy a buck. And I mentioned in that video, generally speaking for homesteaders, it's my opinion that it doesn't make sense to own a buck because economically, you cannot argue that it makes sense for you to be caring for, feeding, maintaining that buck for what you're going to get in return. And so, for Philip, who is quickly becoming a frequent questioner on Ask Home Study, thanks for the questions for Philip, he said, you say breeding two does is not economically to keep your own buck. How many does will it be economical? Probably an autocorrect on you there for Philip. So basically what Philip is saying is, because I said when you're a homesteader who has two does, to pay for a buck to breed those two does, it just doesn't make financial sense. When does it make financial sense to do that? So let's break this down. And we're doing this for goats, but this could apply to any males on the homestead. A farm, generally speaking, is going to keep males around. Not always, a lot of times, especially with like cows, you'll see larger farms using AI. Uh, but a farm or a larger breeder you might see has a buck or two or three. But for a homestead, this is very different. Let's just break it down to simple dollars and cents. You have two does on your homestead and you have them for dairy, for milk, for your family, and maybe cheese. And also maybe just as an enjoyable thing on your homestead. So you think to yourself, every year I have to get these does bred. But I don't have a buck. So I need to fix that problem. So the first thing a lot of people think is I'll go out and buy a buck and that way that buck can every year breed with my does and my one buck and my two does can be a nice little goat flock. Nope, goat herd, it's not a flock if it's goats. It can be a nice little goat herd and everybody will be happy and every year I can have my own babies. It sounds nice but here is the problem with that. 
If you're trying to keep your homestead profitable, where your expenses are covered by what you get in return, that one buck is not a good decision for something you should bring on your homestead. One buck servicing two does spits you out at most four kids, right? If you're not planning on growing your herd, uh, you could sell those four kids. And depending on the quality of your livestock, the market in your area, you may or may not be able to offset the cost of feed and care for the one buck. But I would argue that you shouldn't even consider that. What you should consider is whether or not financially it is more expensive to keep that buck or more expensive to rent or lease that buck or pay for the stud service. And that is all you need to figure out to say whether or not you need to keep a buck on your property because I choose not to keep a buck because they're extra work, they're a little bit more dangerous, they're a little bit more obnoxious, they're definitely stinkier. If I don't have to keep a buck on my homestead, I'm not going to. So let's dive into the numbers, Philip, and see when does it make sense economically to actually have a buck and why doesn't it make sense in our, you know, a couple does scenario like we have here. Let's talk about expense for keeping a buck. First, just everything you're gonna to need to feed and care for this animal on a regular basis. So, a buck is going to eat, this is just a figure for some random buck that I got from the extension service. Your particular buck may vary from these numbers, but this is what I was able to put together for today's answer. One buck every day, an adult male buck, this extension service gave a figure of one pound of feed daily. I pay about $15 for a bag of goat feed, which has about 50 pounds of feed in it, which means my one pound of feed daily costs me about 30 cents. If you multiply 30 cents by 50, you get about $15, which is about what I'm paying for goat feed. One pound a day, 30 cents a day to feed him that feed. Now you could say in the spring and summer and fall, you don't need to give the goat that much feed. We'll get to the different seasons in general, but generally speaking, we're gonna just assume that you live on a small homestead. Maybe you don't have enough pasture to keep them happy. So there's your daily goat feed. Minerals, goat needs, a goat needs minerals. So let's look at the mineral daily, about one ounce for the same buck. That's about 12 cents for the mineral that we use for our bucks here. So yearly, we're talking about about $100 to keep the buck fed, $43 for minerals. Hay, in the winter time, you need lots more hay because there is no pasture. Up north, I factor in about six months for hay. Even though you can have pasture earlier in the season and later, I usually just give it a six month figure because you don't know what to expect and it's always good to expect it to cost you more than less. Where we are, we're paying about $4 a bale, this one buck, He's eating a flake a day. So a flake a day, our bales usually wind up with about 10, nine, eight flakes in one bale. So on average, it's gonna be yearly about $91 in the winter. In the summer, he wouldn't go through a flake a day. He'd go through maybe half a flake, maybe a third of a flake if we have really good forage for the goat. So that's about $30. Just to feed this goat and give him his minerals, assuming you have a well and you don't want to factor in the cost he's the wear and tear on your well for this buck you don't have to pay for city water or water deliveries just to feed that buck for one year it's going to cost you 264 dollars boom that's your first number to consider philip and anybody else and again you can apply the same math to any male species on your homestead we're just looking at a buck what are we not counting in that yearly figure? Well, first off, we're not counting the purchase price. You get a good quality buck for your herd, and I always suggest getting good quality livestock for your homestead. It's how you're gonna feed your family. You better get the best you can afford. You could spend anywhere from 200 to $1,000 on a good quality buck. I didn't factor that into our cost breakdown. Figure out what you'd be willing to spend on a good quality buck, and well, there you go. Add it to that $264 figure, and then amortize that cost yearly to, you know, if you're gonna keep him breeding for three years, four years, five years, stretch that cost out in there. We're also not counting the infrastructure cost that this buck is gonna add to you. You say, Aust, he's a goat. I already have goats. I don't need another goat house. I don't need more goat feeders or waterers. 
wrong. You can't keep your buck in with your does year round. He's gonna be too hard on them, he's gonna to wanna to breed them, the kids can't be around the big buck. You gotta separate him. And if you wanna control breeding at a specific season, that's more time you have to separate him. Separated animal means new housing, new feeders, new waterers. Didn't include that figure because it will be different for everybody. Maybe you already have the infrastructure ready, so don't factor it in if you do. But the point is that's an additional expense. How about the time investment to care for that animal? A buck is going to need fed, he's going to need watered, he's gonna need moved, and if you've ever dealt with a buck, you know they're more annoying to work with than the other animals. They're a nice one like Quinn. I mean, I really like Quinn. Well-mannered, nice buck, he hasn't challenged me at all. Even him, he's still kind of annoying to work with at times because you wanna like, hey, Quinn, come over here so I can clean your stall, and instead he wants to like rub his stinky body all over you. Then there's the smell to add to that too. So whatever your time's worth, if you wanna put a dollar figure to it, you know, what's a farm hand in your area cost, just use that dollar figure for the amount of time you're gonna spend with him a day. That adds up too. Didn't factor that into our $264, don't need to. We'll get to that in a minute. So just all those costs, and then, ready for this? You own your buck. You get him maybe as a little kid, so he's a little bit less money. You raise him up to be two years old, and guess what? Actually, he could be younger to breed. A buck could start breeding around a year old. Don't quote me on that. They can breed. I don't know the exact date the bucks because I've never had my own buck for these reasons. The point is you can breed a buck before he's two years old. You can Google the date. Um, whatever age you need to get him to, to the point of breeding, you put all that money, you put that time, that investment into him, and guess what? He gets West Nile disease and he dies. Now you are still up a creek, not able to get your dose bred. All the money, all the time, all the investment. Much easier, the month before you want your dose to be bred, to go on down to your Lisa Buck farm and say, I want one of your bucks and I want the best quality genetics you got and you pay them for it and you bring them to your homestead and boom. And then you send them off home and you didn't have to care for that buck, you didn't have to pay for feeding him all year round, you didn't have to work with him, none of that. In my opinion, that is worth a lot, not having that worry and that care and that liability in the animal. So what does it cost? Comparison, how does it work out? Well, renting a buck or paying for a stud service, that will depend on who you're using, where you live, and all sorts of things. But just to get an idea, living in Connecticut, living here in Pennsylvania, we've paid $100 for a stud service, we've paid $200 for the stud service, whether or not it was leasing the buck or uh, bringing the does to the buck, the basic stud service, more or less, somewhere around $100 to $200. Feeding the buck for a whole year, $260. Leasing a buck, buck stud service, dropping off your does. Feeding was 260. Leasing and dropping off or any of those was 200. It is cheaper to have that buck service our flock than it is to keep the buck and it's less work. So for me, less money, less work, I'll choose a stud service every time. Before Philip didn't ask me when I would choose a stud service. He asked me, when would I finally say, no, it's worth it to get a buck? Well, do the math. Let's say you're using a stud service where, <coughs> excuse me, they're charging you per doe and it's $50 per doe. Right now I have two does. I don't really ever want to have more than maybe two or three does. So I could do three does, it'd be $150, still cheaper. What if I'm starting a small goat milk dairy and I have six or seven does every year to be bred? Well now it starts to look like I better get my own buck because it's gonna cost me like 600 bucks or 400 bucks or eight, whatever it is, the more does I need serviced, the more times I need that buck, the more money it's gonna be. And now suddenly I wanna say, mm, economically speaking, I should have the buck. But that's not the only reason to make this decision and some of you are saying right now, hey, money isn't everything. You're right. So what other reasons would I consider keeping a buck? Well, control. If control and timing is important to you, then you might wanna have your own buck. And my example for this would be if, again, you're running a commercial dairy or even a small commercial dairy and you know I want all my kidding to happen on this month, so I come in to milk 
during this season and I get to sell my milk during this time period and then I can dry everybody off here. If you want to time things real specific, if you want that control to make sure it works out, having your own buck will help that. One other reason you might consider owning a buck if self-sufficiency is your absolute goal. We talk about this a lot. Self-sufficiency means not needing outside sources of all the animals on the homestead. I think buck, uh, Nubian goats are probably one of the best dual purpose animals you can own. If you're looking to be self-sufficient and not rely on the outside world for anything, having a flock, did it again, a herd of Nubians is a good way to to start up a self-sufficient herd that'll feed you both milk and meat. And if that's your goal and you don't want to rely on anybody, sure, have yourself a buck and that way you don't need to go find anybody with a buck. But now remember, you finally decide I'm gonna bring a buck onto my property, onto my homestead. What does that mean? Well, even if you own this buck now, there is a lifespan, a genetic lifespan to the amount of time that he'll be useful to you. And it is much shorter than his actual lifespan. So a buck, again, they'll become sexually mature. At a year, you can breed them. If you breed them that first generation and now your does have their young, usually people will tell you line breeding is safe to breed the daughters back to the father one time. You can do that one more generation. And then at that point, he has done his work and he can go. And so really you're gonna get two cycles. Now you can continue those genetics. Somebody commented last week on our video about how to uh, breed different genetics in a small herd without adding new bucks. So there are ways to do that. Uh, but his job will be done in just two years. So what you're most likely to do, even if you're a homesteader with a flock of three, four, five does, and you're not really looking to grow much more than that, you're probably every year going to have one buck, if you decide to have a buck at all, you're gonna have the one buck, he'll take care of your herd for that year, maybe one more year after that if you decide to, and then you'll sell him and get another one. And that's exactly what Kay's aunt has done for years over the hill with her Nubian herd. Brings a buck in for a couple years, breeds all the does, and off he goes. And in comes a new one. And this year's new one is the one that we already mentioned, died of West Nile disease. Did I say West Nile before? He got West Nile disease and he died, which is why we are leasing Quinn in the first place, which I think is, is just a better option for someone our size. Kazan's bigger than us. She has more does and more to do over there. Uh, for a homestead size, it really is hard to convince me. Two or three does, lease a buck, that's just, better option in my opinion. It's kind of funny that we're talking so much about actually having a buck because as you know, we're big proponents of AI, artificial insemination. And that is what Hidden Meadow Farm was wondering. They said, I'm glad to hear you talk about the sire side of genetics. A lot of people don't realize you can improve your herd 50% just by using a quality buck for breeding. Bucks can definitely increase the quality of your herd. As they say, uh, it's what they try to do at Hidden Meadow Farm. Have you ever checked into using AI for your goats? It's something I'm interested in trying. Enjoy your channel, Tim. Tim, I'm glad you like our channel. Thank you, keep watching. Tim, AI for goats, all the benefits of AI for cows. You can get better quality genetics at a much reduced price than you know the stud service in person, even if it's just because you don't have to drive somewhere or you know, do all the transferring of an animal that requires more time and money. Uh, artificial insemination, you can get straws shipped to you. Great, amazing genetics. There's some really good, amazing goat genetics out there you could be taking advantage of. You can time it with the use of hormones like we are with our, our cows. Uh, it is a good option for, for all the reasons we like AI for cows, it could apply to goats. You wouldn't have to have a buck and bucks can be more destructive and even dangerous. So why don't we AI our goats? Well, really it comes down to it's hard to find an AI tech for goats, at least where we are. We live in an area where dairy is very big, not specifically right here where we live, but in the area, dairy is a, is a pretty big operation. Back where we were from in Connecticut, dairy was huge. 
So it's not too hard to find an AI tech to come and AI your cows. We have one that we really like. He's already got Ladybug bred. He helped us with our sinking routine so that we could get her bred successfully. Uh, now we got him working on Luna. There, it, It's easier to be an AI tech for cows because there's a lot of dairy farms, a lot of cows, I mean all over the place. Where would somebody become an AI tech for goats? They would have to find an area where within a reasonable commute they could service a lot of goat dairies. We just haven't lived in an area that had a lot of goat dairies. Now you might be able to find somebody who has their own herd of goats and is running a goat dairy and maybe they know how to AI. Maybe they do it for their own and you could pay them to do it for one of yours. You could try to learn yourself. Uh, but just in general, it's harder to find an AI technician for goats and that's why we don't do it. That's why we just go the route of leasing a buck. All this talk about goat kids, let's actually talk about the kids because if everything goes according to plan and it looks like the breeding was successful this week, the goat kids will be coming in the spring, summer-ish time. I have it written down, don't worry, I know when they're coming. The question Wendy wanted to know, are you keeping all the kids slash baby goats? How many are you wanting? Good question, Wendy. I've already said it a few times, I think, in this q and I never want really more than three does. So, what will most likely happen, Lacey and Gizmo, hopefully, will both have two. Kay already did a little bit of foreboding about possibility of a third goat arriving to this farm sometime soon. A third doe, more on that later. There are going to be three pregnant does and they will have two, four, six. They can have triplets. They can have, we had a goat that had quads one time. Uh, so they could have more, they could have less, but generally it's, it's gonna expect each of them to pop out too. So two, four, six kids, that is more does, bucks, whatever, than I plan on having. So what are we gonna do with all of them? If we wind up with any does that we like the looks of, Maybe they've got a beautiful looking coat. Uh, maybe we just grow attached to them. They show good signs of being a nice, healthy animal. We could wind, wind up selling one of our older does. So maybe we would look at our herd and say, which one has the least quality for us? And I could honestly say right now, looking at the way Gizmo's been and the way Lacey's been, looking at their genetics, um, we'd probably wind up selling Lacey first. Gizmo, I haven't looked at her genetics compared to Lacey yet, uh, at like a hard, you know, who's better. But just I can see vitality-wise, dealing with the worming issue, Gizmo has showed herself to be more resilient to worms. Um, and just even just health back and forth. Lacey was a dairy goat on a dairy farm and now she's transitioned to the country here. Gizmo grew up more on a homestead. So she seems to, in my opinion, Gizmo has thrived a bit more in this context. So we probably would wind up replacing Lacey, selling Lacey with one of the does. And then as far as the other does go, we probably wind up selling some kids. And when the time comes to sell kids, we have really good quality genetics. One of the things we are interested in doing here at this homestead, more so than at Squash Hollow Farm. Squash Hollow Farm, we focused a lot on selling meat products and things people could eat. Here at this homestead, we're involved right now a lot in the dairy thing. Uh, so we'd like to focus on good quality livestock for homesteaders who are starting out who want to make sure they have really good quality animals to grow their herds with. We want good quality animals because it's what we feed our family wish with. Uh, we feed our family with the milk from our animals, the meat from our animals, and we want to make sure that those animals are resilient, they don't wind up getting sick easily, they produce good quality, and we have spent years, I mean we've owned goats for the, almost a, a decade and Kay's owned them longer than a decade because she had them growing up. We've seen good ones, we've seen the bad ones, and we've seen how hard it can be to find quality 
animals for your homestead that are the right fit because the people who really focus on their breeding usually are breeding for show. And while they'll have registered animals that are worth money and good quality, they may not be the good qualities you want. If they're breeding for the show, what looks good to a show judge might not be good for a homesteader. A homesteader wants resilient to disease, good confirmation overall, but they want, for example, good milk production, good tasting milk production. Uh, one of the things that Kay's aunt has been breeding for for years that I really appreciate are teats that can be milked by hand easily. If you've ever milked an animal that has small teats, that hurts. Strip milking and dealing with the little teats, it's a lot of work. Kay's aunt's does have teats that a grown man can put into his hand and milk and it's nice and easy. So these are specific traits that are good quality for a homesteader. That's what we're interested in producing here on this farm here in PA. And we will have a waiting list for livestock. If you're interested in purchasing good quality livestock for a homesteader, you know, good production, good handling, good for your land, fun to work with, uh, you know, all the things that are important to a family like ours, when I get that waiting list together, I'll let all of you know, and you can sign up to the waiting list and see, uh, you know, be kind of a first come, first serve kind of deal. If you're interested in livestock, at the time that we know who's for sale and what the prices are and all that, we'll release it to whoever's on that waiting list. So, yes, Wendy, we will be selling some bucks. If anybody be interested in buying bucks for their genetics, you know, will we be able to sell them for the quality of their genetics? We'll see, if not, I will happily raise a couple bucks for the freezer. We really like goat meat. Kay makes some awesome curry dishes, goat curry, and uh, we like eating goats. So the bucks will go the way of the freezer if they don't get sold for genetics. The does will be sold for dairy animals to some homesteader who's looking to start a herd like ours. And maybe we'll keep one or two of our favorites and maybe switch out one of the other girls. Good question here about milk. We've been talking about milk and goats, and dairy and all that stuff. And Eddie wants to know, he's thinking about getting dairy goats, but we've got him curious about the flavor of the milk. He says, is sheep's milk closer to cow's milk in flavor? Also, I've heard fresh goat's milk doesn't have goaty slash earthy flavors like store-bought goat's milk. Have you found this to be true? And he didn't remember to put Ask Homesteady in his question. Don't worry, Eddie. I saw that question and I added the Ask Homesteady hashtag because I knew it's a great question to cover on this channel. But just try to remember everybody, if you wanna get your question answered, put the hashtag Ask Homesteady in your question so I can find it when I sit down to do this every Friday. Eddie, as a general rule, and you will find a lot of general information when you Google whose milk tastes better and who's better for a homesteader, this is what you're going to hear generally, right? The basic answer. Cows eat grass. With the grass, they're going to pick up some dirt, and some soil. You're going to get that. That's going to affect the flavor of their milk. They have larger molecules that make up that milk, larger globules. <laughs> so that's going to affect the, the flavor and the quality and how your body digests it. If you're used to cow milk, well, get ready for a change if you go to goat's milk because goats don't eat grass. They're not getting the same soil. Goats eat a lot of brambles and briars. And you can get that acrid flavor in goat's milk at times, depending on what they're eating, eating different things. Uh, the hormone levels in a goat can affect the flavor of their milk. So if you have a buck, another reason not to keep a buck on your homestead, if you have a buck close by and their girl's hormone levels are rising, that can affect the flavor and change it. Mineral deficiencies are said to affect flavor. And then let's go over the world of sheep. Sheep have a higher fat content than goats or cows. So that's gonna affect your flavor. A lot of people describe sheep's milk as sweeter. That's what you'll find at a basic level Google, right? Here's the different milks, pick and choose as you like. But there is a, there's a problem with that. And the problem is It's an oversimplified question. Whose milk is better? Who tastes more like a cow? Um, because, and not that I'm not yelling at you, Eddie, for the question you asked. I'm just letting you know that it's too hard of an answer, to, a question to answer for you. You'll have to answer it yourself because I can have cows, three different cows lined up 
and taste milk from three different cows and they can taste different, each one of them. This cow's milk, this is a jersey that's on fresh spring pasture and uh, I get the milk raw out of that jersey and it's rich in butter fat and it's delicious, it's got a sweetness to it. Uh, I'm a jersey milk guy, it's my thing. Over here we have a Holstein uh, that got himself in an onion patch and it's a less butter fat quality, more watery and it got into something it shouldn't have and that affects the flavor. And then I have some, you know, meat milk cross over here with a low butter fat volume. You can get three different cows, three different kinds of milk. So does sheep or goat taste more like the cow? Well, which cow? Uh, this is the problem. We have been, and I include myself in this, Eddie, we all have been so far removed from the basic milk product that one cow gives in our mind, most of us think of milk now. You go to the supermarket, you get your gallon of milk, and that jug of milk kind of all tastes the same. If I buy a gallon of milk in Pennsylvania and a gallon of milk in Connecticut, it kind of all tastes the same. And that's because most of it's been produced in the same way. A whole lot of Holsteins in a, you know, a, one farm where they've been fed all kind of the same ration, and maybe some silage. It's gone through the ultra pasteurizing process so it's been scorched you know real hot heat kill off all kinds of stuff in it and then bottled and put on the shelf for us and it's a week old when we're drinking it you know that's what so much of our our palates are used to when we think of milk but that's not what one cow's milk tastes like if you drink raw milk produced from that same farm and i know this because there's been times that we've had raw milk from a, a holstein a bulk farm tank. We've gone to a Holstein farm with a bulk tank. They're making milk for craft, and we've popped that open and drank it. That milk tastes different than the gallon at the supermarket. <coughs> Excuse me. And then that individual cow, one cow in the whole herd, would taste even more different. So cow's milk all tastes different, and then the same is true about goats. You can read an article that says, you know, sheep's milk tastes better than goat's milk but i guarantee you i could find a sheep that had bad tasting milk and a goat we used to have a nigerian alpine nigerian dwarf alpine cross she only gave this much milk a little like quarter of a quart every day but that milk would in a blind taste test you would be fooled that that was like jersey raw jersey milk it was buttery fat rich sweet everything you love about jersey milk that that little goat was making the same thing. She was making this much of it, so it didn't make sense for me to spend much time milking her, but it was, it was d delicious quality milk, better than probably a lot of sheep milk out there. Sheep milk, same thing. There's gonna be some great quality sheep milk out there. There's gonna be some that maybe, now sheep milk, some people say it's too sweet. It's too high sugar uh, tasting. So I'm not trying to shoot holes in your question, Eddie. I'm not trying to make you feel like, oh, I haven't sampled all these milks. What I'm trying to point out is if you're deciding for your homestead what you want, you need to explore more options. You need to go on field trips, go to farms who produce what you want to produce. If you're interested in getting some Nubian dairy goats because your favorite YouTube homesteading channel loves Nubians, if you're used, if that's what you're into, we'll go to a farm that has Nubian goats and is in milk and and why are they going to give you the time of day? Because if they do, you'll buy kids from them. Let ask them, hey, do you sell kids in the springtime? Yep, we sure do. I'm interested in getting some. Do you mind if I come and try the milk? If they say no, don't buy goats from them. Go somewhere else. I guarantee you'll find somebody who will let you try the milk if they're going to sell you a kid. A farm might let you come just to do the field trip. A farm might not want to be wasted you know, have their time wasted by your presence. But if they don't want to waste their time with sharing the milk with you, you know, don't buy a kid from them. Find somebody who doesn't mind spending some time letting you try the product. We went to a goat dairy one time. We got to try their product, uh, try out some cheeses. We didn't even wind up buying a goat from them because they only wanted to sell us two La Manchas that were ugly. And we're vain when it comes to goats. We like pretty goats. You see that gizmo? She's got a beautiful coat. So, 
go and do some field trips. Taste sheep's, the kind of sheep you're looking at, taste their milk. The kind of goats you're looking at, taste their milk. Is it true that fresh Nubian milk will not, or fresh goat milk period will not be so goaty in flavor? Absolutely. Fresh goat milk is a total different animal compared to older goat milk. But that's true about all milks. The fresher it is, the better quality, more delicious, all good things. I like fresh milk. That's why we have, well, we have a dairy thing here because the women in my life love dairy animals. But I'm a big fan of the raw product that comes from it. You're probably going to be a big fan of the product that comes from it if you do your homework. If you don't, I guarantee you, any of the animals we talked about here, you can find ones that have awful tasting milk and you'll be disappointed by. I've had goats that had great quality milk. I've got goats that milk tasted just bleh. We like, couldn't even drink it. It was a waste of our time to milk that animal. So do your homework, try stuff out, and that's the only way you'll be sure. Whatever you're used to, whatever you think milk should taste like, find an animal that matches that, or get used to an animal that tastes different and uh, you know, teach yourself to like that. So I hope that helps. That's how I suggest anybody looking to get into a homestead milk go about purchasing their animal. That's the end of today's Ask Home Study, but it's not the end of Ask Home Study for the week. Like we said, we're going to be splitting Ask Home Study up now into three days, three parts, <clears throat> basically taking the weekend to answer your questions. And you'll see another format change coming next week. We'll talk about that next week. I'm really excited. Ask Home Study has become a huge part of this channel and it's because you have questions and you're not afraid to ask and I'm not afraid to try to answer them as best I can with the experience I have and leaning on the experience of the others that I've taken on as mentors. I really appreciate you watching to the end. If you like Ask Home Study, you can be sure that we keep doing it by supporting this channel by becoming a home study pioneer. There's a whole lot of bonus content about goats, learn how to make money with goats, uh, learn about breeding goats, become a pioneer. It's five bucks a month. You get a lot of bonus content. You get discounts on homesteading supplies. Northeast Edible gives 10% discount on your entire purchase for your orchards and your fruit trees and things. That right there, you can save five bucks a month easily on orchard stuff. Uh, or if you're not going to be a pioneer, that's okay. If you're going to do shopping on Amazon, type in www.amsteady.com. That will forward you to Amazon or click in the link in our description below. What's coming tomorrow and the next day on Ask Home Study? Funny should you should ask. Do you want to homestead and go on vacation? You can do it. We've been doing it for years. We'll tell you how. And how can a homesteader who's brand new diving in be sure they don't get in over their head? Any rule of thumb there? We're going to help you out with that question and a whole lot more. So join us tomorrow and the next day as we answer your questions. And if you have questions for us next week, hashtag Ask Homesteady in the comments section. And we will try to answer as many as we can. See you in tomorrow's video. If you're interested in growing a goat herd of your own on your own homestead, there's a lot of bonus content about raising goats, making money with goats in the Pioneer Library. It's five bucks a month. You can click here to become a Pioneer and instantly you have access to bonus podcasts, classes, interviews, all about raising goats and making money with goats. Click here to learn more.